It's the Dearly Departed Podcast, featuring your host, historian Scott Michaels and filmmaker Mike Dorsey. All right, it's uh, episode 25, I think, here of the uh, Dearly Departed Podcast. And this is our uh, 2020 holiday special, so to speak. The, ex- and, the extravaganza. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm Mike yeah, Dorsey. Scott Michaels. And this is Dearly Departed Podcast. So we are uh, going to do a, uh, uh, since the holiday special, we are going to do the Christmas at Pee Wee's Playhouse television special from 1988. And it's kooky cast of walk-on characters. And uh, it is a wild one. And it came, uh, it, was, it was recommended by one of our Patreon supporters, Melissa. So thank you, Melissa, for su- suggesting this one. And uh, uh, if you uh, are not a Patreon supporter, uh, hustle all over, over there and uh, sign up if you don't mind. It's uh, two dollars a month, uh, and uh, you can do, f- or you can do five, and uh, you get early access to our shows every month, like uh, like this one. If you do five a month, and everybody that subscribes on Patreon also gets, uh, we do extra mini shows between our main ones, uh, and we just recorded our uh, mini show for December. So. Um, thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for uh, helping you know, keep the show you. going. Yeah, the the one that we do usually for the Patreons is the obituaries the, uh, since the last episode. So we touch on the biggies that died, and uh, and uh, so that that is the exclusive to the uh, to the supporters on Patreon. So please sign up and thank you. Yeah, we just talked about uh, Alex Trebek and uh, David Prowse and Dame Barbara Windsor. And uh, Rayford Johnson and Bobby Brown Jr. and a bunch of other cool, uh, interesting people that passed away since we did our last show. So, uh, so uh, what have you been up to, Scott? Your background's interesting. <laughs> it's the same background <laughs> I've ever had, but I'm oh. not here. <laughs> I will. In fact, I can go anywhere. I can go to Pee Wee's Dinosaurs. Uh, now I know, right? <laughs> No, we've uh, we've moved, and uh, luckily I grabbed a screen capture of, uh, of my old office, which is uh, familiar because where I am right now is basically a room with nothing on the walls. And we've moved uh, just near Palm Springs, and we've been here uh, a little over a month now, full Congrats. time. And uh, it's uh, a different life, and uh, and, I, and I like it out here. It's nice and quiet, and. And uh, it gets me away from the stress. Since Dearly Departed Tours is pretty much non-existent anymore, uh, I just figure, why why should I stay there when I can go someplace? It's a bit more chill. So right. uh, I get a, a bit of elbow room, and I can see the mountains in my backyard. And and uh, and it's, it's like I say, it's a gentler life. I'm not sure if uh, how how I'm going to adjust to it in the long run because I've always lived in major cities you know i've been in los angeles right on the main street in detroit and chicago and and, right. and london and always right in the in the center of things and now if i'm going to see a show at the hollywood bowl it's a two-hour trip so i'm not sure you know in the long run how this is all going to go but it's, but but we made this choice troy and i did and and uh and i'm happy with where we are I love Palm Springs, and uh, I lived in Temecula for a time after I had lived in L.A. for a few years, and it was actually kind of nice. I'd come out once a month, maybe. I'd come out for a weekend, and it, mm-hmm. I'd, stay in an, I'd stay in a different hotel every time almost in L.A., and it's kind of a chance to like try out all the different spots I never had an excuse to because <laughs> I lived here. So it yeah. can kind of kind of be fun, to be perfectly honest. It's almost like you come in and you get the best parts of the city, and then you go back out to where it's a little quieter for a while. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I love Palm Springs, so that's really cool. Um, we'll I'm see not if you looking like forward to 120 degrees say, every summer. Gonna, that's we'll, the part we'll that I'm like... <laughs> we'll see if you like it in August. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I, uh, if any of you follow my social media, I um, did something that Scott and I said we would never do again. I went all the way out to Barker Ranch in Death Valley. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, which is where the Manson family was arrested for the last time uh, before being charged with the Tate LaBianca murders. And uh, it was wild because, you know, when we were last out there, the house was still standing, and now it's just ruins. The roof is gone and a lot of the walls are gone because it burned down a couple years after we were out there. It burned down in 2009. Um, But it it was kind of cathartic, I guess, to go out there again and see it 
with fresh eyes. You know, not just my memories and from when we filmed the Six Degrees of Helter Skelter. To see it again was interesting. Uh, it was for a show I, I'm working on for uh, um, Motor Trend TV, which is one of the Discovery channels. Uh, it used to be Velocity. That's uh, their mm-hmm. car channel. So we're doing a car-centric crime series. So I pitched them on doing something Manson-related with the trucks out there, the power wagons, the Dodge power mm-hmm. wagons that have been abandoned out there. It was actually a really interesting trip for a couple of reasons. The the one that has the Helter Skelter spray painted on the back has been dug out of the dirt and is just sitting there on top of the ground now, uh, the, the one that was behind the ranch. Um, and it, uh, it has been super pit clean even more than before the doors are gone. <laughs> it's oh, wow. like nothing. It's really, really picked over, but it used, it was half buried in the dirt when we were there and now they've kind of made that into more of a proper road. So somebody dug it out and kind of pushed it off to the side of the road. So you can mm-hmm. kind of see more of it now than you could before. And then I had a fascinating conversation, uh, with a guy that uh, manages the store in Ballarat and it was oh, not they the just redid that, it, didn't they? Yeah. yeah it's they just, nice. Yeah. It's nice, and the guy, or nicer, and the guy, uh, it's not the guys that we dealt with when we were out there. It was a younger guy, and he claims to be the grandson of the Barkers. Hmm. And he had all kinds of stories. Uh, we sat out there and talked for uh, a half hour, probably at least, and he, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he told the story about the power wagon that's parked there at Ballarat, um, mm-hmm. which he says is the one that Tex attempted to flee in. And it got stuck in the uh, in in the the, the the lake bed, and he said that his grandmother uh, cl- then claimed the car because the police just left it out there stuck in the mud. Uh, he says they kind of processed it for evidence and then just left it. They had no use for it, and she was kind of like, "Well, he doesn't need it anymore," so she took it. And he claims she drove it around for a few years, all over the place until it started having you know mechanical issues and stuff, and that's when they just parked it there in front of the shop and left it. Um, Interesting. So that that that's his claim about the about what happened with that, and um, um, what was the other thing he said? He talked about you know the, them getting rid of the bus, which we've heard that story before. The Manson bus that was left behind. Uh, he mm-hmm. also said something interesting. I, I don't know if I'd ever read this before, but he said you know when they were raided, of course the the law enforcement didn't know yet about their connection to the Tate Labianca murders. You know they were arrested for vandalism, and. Um, it wasn't until later. So he said there was the initial raid on the camp when they arrested everybody, and then they came back, you know, however many weeks later, once they had been tied to the crimes, the police came out a second time and did a real, like, processed the ranch, as, the Barker Ranch, as a crime scene looking for evidence, basically, that might help the, with, the, with the murder. So it was the police went out there a couple of different times. Um, I see. When, once they found out what they needed, you know, they needed to, that these people were involved in uh, murders. So, right. Uh, and I, mean, I don't it makes know if sense. they found yeah. anything, but yeah, it makes perfect sense that they would go out there and see if there was any evidence left behind. So, you know, there could have been murder weapons out there and stuff that they didn't even know to look for <laughs> when they raided. Well, the, I mean, they went out there at least two times afterwards for body digs uh, and mm-hmm. didn't uh, and didn't come up with anything. So, right. so yeah, interesting. So, yeah, it was great. And uh, I forget, this is also funny. You know, when we went out there, we had like a little Garmin GPS with us. Yes. Uh, you remember? And it, and it took us right there. Yeah. I mean, it was the it was accurate. I did not anticipate that, you know, that's satellite connected. And there is no cell phone coverage at all anywhere in Panamint Valley, any, around Ballarat at all. As soon as you drop down into that valley, your cell phone goes to no bars and you never get it back until you leave the yeah. valley. So I didn't yeah, realize. Yeah, it was like Trona is the, is the cutoff point. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically it. Yeah, once you leave Trona, you have no cell phone coverage. And so I didn't anticipate, oh, yeah, you, that means your map is going to go away. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it was. Uh, there was a moment there when I'm like, it was 13 years ago that we were out there and trying to remember <laughs> all these different dirt roads 13 years later. Uh, somehow I was able to find it, but it was. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it there for a time. So that's something to keep in mind if you ever go out there. Uh, either have a good, you know, a, a printout of a map with you that, so you can keep track of things. And, uh, and also uh, if you have a Garmin or something like that that's satellite connected, you'll have better luck getting in there. But also, you know, the locals, I think, or various people have taken down a lot of the markers. So remember when it said Golder Wash? On like mm-hmm. that that metal can that's that's gone. Uh, the various little street signs that are in the canyons are gone. So you really, unless you know where you're going, it's tough to figure out. Where was it going. just you and a car? Uh, it was two two cars. It was three crew in in, in two different vehicles. Uh, I was in a pickup truck. Okay. Uh, it was a two wheel drive truck. We did. I did fine. I mean, it's a it's a bit of a rough road, but uh, if you have some experience off roading, you can get in with two wheels as long as you have good clearance. Um, mm-hmm. 
Uh, and then the other car with us was a four-wheel drive truck. So, yeah. But it's cool to go cool. out there and see it. And you, you don't see anybody out there. I mean, we were at the ranch for probably three or four hours, never saw anybody. We only saw people when we mm-hmm. were come, going in and out of the canyon. So mm-hmm. uh, and it's just a really wild and exotic place to go spend a day. Mm-hmm. For sure. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was I uh, started watching Scrubs for the first time. Uh, the sitcom, uh, the Zach Braff sitcom from like a decade mm-hmm. ago. And, uh, or technically, I mean, it started, I mean, it premiered, uh, I think like three weeks after 9 11 happened, mm-hmm. was that show's premiere. But there's a really disturbing thing in it, uh, that most people watching would probably not pick up on, but, but I definitely did. At the end of episode seven in season two, episode called My First Step, Zach Braff and Sarah Chalk's characters jump off bungee cord jumping suicide bridge oh interesting huh. yep uh and it is it, right over the uh the canal you know that concrete canal that it looks down on that's where they go yeah. off it's right there and, and the actors uh were supposed to do it themselves but chickened out kind of at the last second and they got two uh stunt people to do it for them and according to Sarah Chalk, uh, years later on Twitter, she claimed that those two stunt people, a man and woman, uh, met for the first time on that set, fell in love, and were married, and are now married husband and wife from doing that bungee cord jump together. But it's really weird to see somebody, two, <laughs> basically two, I mean, even though they're stunt doubles, to see two famous people, quote unquote, jump off the suicide bridge, and the camera like goes over the side with them, and then there's like the view looking up at them jumping off. I mean, it's what, you, what it would look like to see someone actually jumping off that bridge, which is one of the more uh, uh, heavily used suicide jumping spots in all of Los Angeles there near Pasadena, so... Yeah, I haven't it been up there disturbing. in a while, but uh, they, it's, the last time I was there, they had sort of makeshift fences up there, but they probably made something a bit more permanent now. Uh, so you, uh, to, to you know, people will find a way. It doesn't matter. But Suicide Bridge, this Colorado Street Bridge in Pasadena, that's massively huge. Uh, uh, when you're going over, it doesn't seem that way. You look over the edge, and it's like, holy Christ! It's it's really yeah. it is it is a tall bridge. So. Um, and yeah, a, a landmark as the Suicide Bridge. I think they call it the Arroyo Seco Bridge. I think that's what it's really called. Yeah, it's just south of the the, the Rose Bowl. It's a beautiful old bridge, mm-hmm. and you yeah, film, it it's used a lot for filming and stuff because it's a gorgeous old bridge. Uh, that was my that was my news. Cool. cool. And you moved to Palm Springs. I did. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think of anything really good that I've done. I mean, I've done some stuff. I've been working on the YouTube stuff, and uh, uh, the last thing I did was. Uh, uh, I uh, oh I got a lottery ticket. I'll show you. I just got a new one, but it's um, it's it's called it's called California Dreaming, and okay. I live five minutes drive from John Phillips Grave, who wrote it, who wrote the song California Dreaming of the Mamas and the Papas. So the last video I did, I went with my lottery ticket and I scratched it off at his grave. And uh, I won 10 bucks, and this is my replacement. So I've got to go back to his grave now and do this one. (laughs) But but I'm literally down the road from Sinatra and Sonny Bono and a whole ton of people. It's 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 a it's an odd place, Palm Springs. I like it uh, a lot, but it's it's an odd place. It's got a real showbiz vibe, which is why we chose it, because we can, you know, maybe do a tour or we can open up our museum here. And I've already had a couple of people reach out. One guy that used to be Liberace's protege and another gentleman who is. Uh, involved with uh, uh, local politics, and they, they've reached out to welcome me. So we'll see what happens. But I'm excited to see. Yeah, I'm excited to see what's going to happen once tourism kicks back in again. Uh, it's not, you know, we're not LA County, so things are a little bit different here as far as you know the lockdowns and the closures go. Um, so um, I could say it's just it's just a bigger space. There's lots, uh, you know, there's lots of room here, which is why right. It's not as intense as L.A. is, so they're mm-hmm. not as uh, diligent with closures and things. Right. Uh, yeah, there's some amazing old neighborhoods. Of course, you got Twin Palms. You know, one of Sinatra's homes is out there. Uh, the, the Elvis Honeymoon House is out there. Um, mm-hmm. which I think recently sold or was recently put up for sale. Uh, the Kaufman Desert House, one of the most famous, architecturally, one of the most famous houses in the world is there. Um, the Elrod House, another famous one from um, uh, from one of the James Bond films, uh, the second film. Uh, and um, 
Yeah, I love it out there. And uh, Modernism Week is a lot of fun and draws a lot of uh, tour- tourism mm-hmm. uh, business there, and the whole town kind of gets behind it. So, yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's a, it's, a, it's a cool, it's an interesting place. There's no, there's no, it's a tourist town. You know, there's not a whole lot of industry here, uh, you know, retail mostly, if there's going to be one. So, uh, so it's interesting, yeah. Yeah. It's a good place to shop for mid century modern furniture, although you're not necessarily going to find any good deals, uh, but you find cool stuff. I mean, a thrift store is here. There's one in there because people, people come here to die. You know what I mean? People are just, <laughs> they do. Right. Old people, they just die. And the thrift stores are spectacular. You know, they, they've got this, they have, you know, you could find some really cool stuff. And we have. So, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's, there's, uh, there's cool vintage clothing stores there and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a, and it's, it's cool. The cool kind, not like the, you know, right. 40s yeah. stuff, but it's all like the lovey howl, you know? <laughs> so, yes. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the big flowery printed moo moos and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Uh, the cocktail dresses from the '60s and '50s. Yeah, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. So, uh, did we get any hate mail? Hate mail. Well, you know, we got some love mail and we got some hate yes. mail. Now, All right. So, I did a movie called. Uh, I did a movie called, uh, on my YouTube channel, The Death of Donald Turnipseed, The Man Who Killed James Dean, accidentally. Yeah. And people are, you know, no, nah, Jimmy was going too fast. Well, maybe Jimmy was going fast, but it doesn't matter. The guy made an illegal left in front of James Dean, so he didn't gauge it's it right. It's the fault of him. It's the fault of the guy that turned yeah, in front of and, the other guy. Yeah. Right. So, they, I mean, they, they ruled it, you know, that it was accidental, and that's, it was nobody's intentional fault. It wasn't really malicious. It wasn't... He just sure. never saw him. It was accidental. He was an accidental killer, and that is legitimately a thing. Look it up. I've I've learned a lot about it when I but since I've been doing the stuff with the crisis response team. So uh, yeah. it's a it's a legitimate thing. So I, I get a lot of like he was not a killer. It was Jimmy's fault, et cetera, et cetera. It's like okay, whatever. You, that's your interpretation, but it wasn't Jimmy's fault, <laughs> even if he was speeding. Uh, but right. I, I call him Jimmy. Everyone calls him Jimmy who loves James Dean. You know, it's always you know it's Jimmy. But this guy says. Right. Um, this guy says, Jimmy, were you and James Dean buddies? You were so close that you were so comfortable to use a nickname that nobody else ever called him? Or are you just trying to come off as some pretentious jack wagon who is only cool in his own mind? I'm going for the jack wagon because I never heard that one before. I love that. Uh, you're a jack That's wagon. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, the other thing that was an int- a comment that I got was about, I did a, a video about Stephen Parent, who was the kid who was uh, the first, uh, well, the kid who, who didn't belong at the house on Cielo Drive the night of the Tate murders. Uh, he was uh, killed in the driveway. Now, I put a theory out there, which I still stand by, that he was actually killed uh, last, not first. Okay. Interesting. And uh, there's, there's several different reasons why I believe that to be true. And, uh, and I put them forward in this video, you know, and I'm not saying I'm, it's definitive. I'm just saying that this is something that I think is worthy of looking at. It's a different theory. And people get really pissed off because the eyewitness accounts say otherwise. I'm like, the eyewitnesses were freaking murderers and liars. So, and, you know, uh, who says, and there were a couple of, <laughs> were, yeah, a couple of <laughs> they were jacked up on, on speed. And like, they weren't thinking straight anyway. But that was a theory that I put out there, and I think it's a leg- sure. I gave a reason, the reason I feel that way. So this is like one of the most pretentious emails I've ever got. And this is the theory, quote unquote, that parent was killed last, has the odor of DIY sleuth for a day, crank revisionism, multi-eyewitness testimony from those with nothing to gain, flatly contradicts this theory. That should be good enough, and it is though not to pile it on. We also have the damage to the fence railing more plausibly explained by Tex and the girls pushing the car back up the driveway after a parent was killed first. Now, there's, there's damage to a fence on the property, damage to Stephen right. Parent's car. I put forward what I thought happened in this video, and he's going by what was written in Elder Skelter, which, you know, right. we've all learned that is a little bit different than what really happened. So... Um, and Parent, Stephen Parent said, I won't tell anyone, easily interpreted as not telling anyone about seeing Tex hopping the fence and brandishing weapons, obviously up to no good. Not about seeing seven people killed. Well, see, my theory was Stephen Parent, for, if he was the first victim, why did he say to Tex Watson, don't worry, I won't say anything? He didn't see anything. Right. All he was doing was pulling up to the gate. 
He didn't know who it was yeah. hopping over the fence. So my theory right. was he already saw what went on. He was taken off, went up to the gate, accidentally put the car into reverse and hit the fence, then put it forward. And Tex stopped him. And then he said, get out of there, yeah. I won't say anything. That makes more right. sense. So he's saying, well, yeah. the murderers there, they say, say differently. And I'm like, all right. So to me, that's how I interpret it. Tex, Tex hopped over the fence. Another thing that's important to note is that Stephen Perry had knife wounds on his arm. Then he right. was shot, which would have meant Tex, if, he, if the whole thing took place right in front of the gate, Tex would have had to slice him with one hand and shoot him with the other. Nobody's that ambidextrous, especially in a situation like that. So it makes mm-hmm. more sense to me that back there, Stephen Perry was hurt with the knife, then up at the gate was shot. That's the way I interpret it, and that's the what I right. what I you know I subscribe to personally. I'm not saying you have to, but that's just what I put forward. So sure. he said, um, "Not a, a Tex Watson, not the brightest bulb in the chandelier, fired shots before entering the Tate house." So, finally, to assume that Tex would need ambidexterity, which you further assume he lacked, to stab and shoot, wallows in rank speculation. That a theory, in quotes again, this bad can be submitted, presumably in good faith, to counter the, quote, official version, is testament to how solid that version really is, which is bullshit. But um, but that was like the most pretentious, I didn't even want to say the word, but it, it's... Yeah. it's <laughs> that guy sounds like a real like, jack wagon. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, right? I was, I mean, and it's usually I, you know, people usually say nice things. If they say nasty things, I'm fine with that too. But this is yeah. such a, such a pretentious thing, you know, right. crank revision of them, revisionism. Uh, anyway. Mm-hmm. So, okay. <laughs> so those are the two Haiti ones. Now I got to go to really if interesting ever, if, you ever, if you ever read an autobiography, that's what you should name it. Crank revisionism. Crank revisionism. <laughs> 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 well, there was somebody that when I when I got sued by Selena's father because I put together that uh, that horrible um, well it wasn't horrible it was a it was a, a I put it together for Find a Death the story of her death and somebody yeah. posted it and somebody one of the comments was I have desire of vomit. <laughs> so, right. so that was going to be my, my autobiography. I have, desire, I have desire, desire of vomit. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, awesome. there are these nuggets of really interesting information that come out. And this is a woman who wrote to me. I live in Fairmount, Indiana, James Dean's hometown, where he's buried, right. where he's from and where he's buried. I can see his grave standing at my kitchen window. His family are really nice. Until this year, we had James Dean days in the last weekend of September. It's always a huge thing in Fairmount right. for that weekend. They have a lookalike contest, old cars, yep. etc. Uh, There's it's a museum not, uh, there that has a bunch of his stuff. Yes, yeah, there's cool. a couple of them. So he says that uh, not widely known, but he was bisexual and had a fetish of public pee. <laughs> okay, whatever. His tombstone <laughs> has hundreds of lips, kisses on it, cigarettes, and signatures of visitors. It also gets stolen about once every 10 years. Over the aisle, this is the interesting bit. Over the aisle is the grave of Mary O'Connor. She was Hugh Hefner's secretary for decades. When she died, unbeknownst to the locals, Hugh rolled into town for her funeral and got his photo standing next to James Dean's grave. It also said to be haunted. There's some weird facts for you. But I looked it up, and Mary O'Connor is indeed buried in Fairmount Cemetery in the same cemetery as James Dean. And I met oh, her wild. when I did I did an episode of uh, The Girls Next Door. I met her at the Playboy Mansion. And uh, and it was just, okay, there's some weird Hugh Hefner and Fairmount. Because a lot of celebrities do visit Fairmount for James Dean, uh, you know, to pay homage or whatever. But uh, the fact that the Playboy secretary who, you know, is from Fairmount, is there in Fairmount by James Dean. I think it's a fascinating little nugget of information. And Hugh Hefner is buried next to Marilyn Monroe, another icon who died too young. Yes, yes. But Hugh didn't die too young. No, 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 no. <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> no, but, Mar- you know, he bought that grave. God, he paid, he paid 15 k for that grave back in the 70s. And that wow. thing is worth, if he would have sold it, would have easily more than a mill, easily. But she oh, was the really? first centerfold for... Uh, for Playboy, and uh, mm-hmm. or the first, she was on the first cover of Playboy magazine, and I'm not sure if the pictures inside were the the red calendar pictures, but uh, but certainly yeah. helped put Hugh Hefner on the map. Yeah. Now uh, the other one, this is an interesting one. A, a woman named Ivy sends this. I live in the mountains of North Carolina and grew up 20 minutes from the Land of Oz amusement park in Beach Mountain, North Carolina. 
This is obviously about our Wizard of Oz podcast. Sure. It isn't abandoned, no matter what the internet says. It opened in June of 1970, and Debbie Reynolds and Carrie Fisher were both at the ribbon-cutting ceremony. <laughs> at the time, the park was a big deal. Unfortunately, several things happened. Several of the shops caught fire. An original Dorothy dress purchased from the MGM auction and other, not sure what, collectibles were stolen and other things that caused the park to be shut down. I think sometime in the late 90s, it was reopened for one weekend a year in October, and it's a frigid, on-top-of-a-mountain place. The last few years, they were open several weekends in the summer. Thank you for all your hard work in keeping this history alive. I really appreciate all you've done and continue to do. Uh, a very kind email from... Um, from Ivy. And Jennifer, thank you for the other email about James Dean. Uh, and that's that for the hate mail. Although I have one more one more piece of mail that came in. And this is a guy by the name of Jed, Jed Keck, who is a longtime listener of the podcast. I think we may have even mentioned him before. But mm -hmm. I, I, he says, you've mentioned Tom Lester and Robert Blake in your podcast. Now, Tom Lester played Ab in Green Acres, and Robert Blake is obviously Robert Blake. So he said, I just remembered, back in 1982, I went to church to hear Tom Lester speak. He's a very religious man. And remember him saying that he and Robert Blake were friends. They worked at the gym, worked out at the gym together. He said Robert's nickname for him was Naz, or the Naz, short for Nazarene, of course. Hmm. So I just thought that was a, n a nice, interesting nugget of information from, uh, from Jed Keck. So thank you. And thank you for the people that write in. Even if uh, yeah. you write dicky things... Um, we read them and we enjoy them. So thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you for your time. Yes. <laughs> it's time for the main feature. So we are uh, talking about the Christmas at Pee Wee's Playhouse, the Christmas special from 1988 that has almost has its own little cult following uh, in addition to the, the main show itself. So, Scott, you're the big fan of this. So yeah, I've said it since uh, since the, it. since it came out. It is the greatest hour of television ever made. I mean, I, when it, the day it came out, I, I lost my mind over it because it was so <laughs> incredible. It was so it was so it was pure, you know, because it was you know the Pee Wee character was just this this kid in awe, you know, that was the character, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but the the then the guest stars came out. It's like oh oh my oh my oh my every two seconds. I mean these <laughs> legends Legendary people come out for fifteen second cameos, right. and it is jam packed with with stuff. I mean, and now I just got the Blu-ray because I, I must have seen that show. You know, I'm not going to say hundreds of times, but probably, you know, certainly dozens of times. And uh, and the Blu-ray comes out, and it's like, oh my god, I see all the stuff going on in the background, and things are spinning and whirring, and it's the costumes are spectacular, and uh, it was just. Legend after legend, it was it was a great show, a great show. Starting with the day that it, it premiered, it aired on the day of the Lockerbie bombing. You oh, know? really? Yeah, December twenty first, nineteen eighty eight. Two hundred fifty nine people were killed in a bomb blast over Lockerbie, Scotland, on a Pan Am flight, and that was the day Pee Wee Herman's uh, Pee Wee's Christmas Special aired. It was shot wow. at Hollywood Center Studios, and uh, where they made the Adams Family and the Beverly Hillbillies and. I Love Lucy for the first two years of it. And they threw it together. I mean, this thing was done in like a week in November and it aired in December. I mean, they were talking about shooting this on Thanksgiving and uh, they just sent these letters out to everybody they thought would be fun to be in the show. And they were shocked at the responses the uh, of people that said that they would do it. I and mean, people would literally stop in for 20 minutes and do their cameo and leave. And, right. uh, and um, the only one that they asked, uh, as, I, as far as I understand it, was Elizabeth Taylor, who didn't show up. And she sent a regret. But uh, but all these uh, it's it's mind numbing how many people are in this. <laughs> You, when you see the list, you, you get, before you watch the show, you're like, how in the world did they fit all these people into a one-hour special? But that's why. Yeah. They just rolled them through. <laughs> yeah. And then there, was, there were other ones like, uh, you know, Joan Rivers and, and Oprah and, and, uh, and Whoopi Goldberg, who just showed up in TV segments, you know, right. video calls. So they didn't have to be there. So it was like, right. that, you know, that was... Um, it's really clever, you know, and there's it's a very clever show because they like, for instance, Magic Johnson, 
you know, he shows up in it and he had a game that day. He had one hour to do and he showed up <laughs> and it was clever because there's a character on Pee Wee's Playhouse called the Magic Screen. And the Magic Screen, you go through it and it would show you film clips, a lot of, you know, stock cartoon footage, et cetera, and, um, and educational films. And, and, they you know, the Magic Screen and Magic Johnson, he's, they said we're cousins. It's like, that's really clever. I was really uh, surprised by that. And the Countess, who was the, you know, the the regal cow who uh, mm. everything she says has a moo in it. And, uh, you know, got <laughs> Princess Zsa, Zsa there, you know, and it's like, oh, my God, that's really clever. How do they you know, they came up with this stuff really quickly? Yeah. And that just goes to show you, though, how, you know, certain things are organic and they can try to do a show like that. And it, it could not be. It would be so contrived and not as on the cuff as this one. They put it together in a couple of weeks, threw this together, and here we are, you know, 30 years later still talking right. about it. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, do you want to dive into uh, the names? Okay. Well, the, the, so it started with um, it started with the the chorus, the UCLA men's chorus, who dressed up to be uh, Marines, the Marine Corps, but it was actually the UCLA men's choirs, choir who all had to okay. shave their heads to do it and uh, to make <laughs> it look like they were military. And, oh, uh, and they came up with this whole song that it, the song was actually written by um, John Paragon, who was one of the founders of the Groundlings comedy troupe, who you know, we know Terry Bolo, uh, who was the, the works of Dearly Departed Tours. She's one of the founders, Lorraine Newman. Uh, 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 Elvira, Cassandra Peterson, Phil Hartman. They were all founders of the Groundlings, as was John Paragon, who plays Jombie, and Paul Rubens, who was Pee Wee Herman. So the two of them wrote this, and they wrote that um, that song, which in the commentary tracks is fascinating because everyone loves that the most in the show. The people that worked on it were like, the opening sequence. It's Paul Rubin's favorite sequence because he comes out, the chorus is singing, all of a sudden it goes wacky and the two background singers come in and they just introduce pow, 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 50 names of all, I think I think I counted it was 52 names that they, you know, and my special guest star and the regulars, Miss Yvonne, <laughs> Terry and, and then our right. special, special guest stars. It was like pow, pow, pow. It was, it was really clever. And the two, uh, and the, when it first opened, you know, it's it's like right out of Rankin Bass, you know, those old classic uh, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer and uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Those old stop uh, am- stop animation they call that, and uh, so the the beginning of the show is is right out of that with the moving snowmen and the little elves, the mechanical elves. It goes into the Marines, then the background singers come in, and they do... And the Supremes, they were like the Supremes. There were two girls that came in wearing gold, shimmery dresses, and they're doing the, you know, Pee Wee's Christmas thing and the choreography. And uh, Nikki Harris was one of them, and she was uh, she worked with Madonna for years and years as a, as a singer, a background singer, and a, and a proper you know, cuts albums on her own sort of thing. But it was another one of those odd kind of, because it's not even in the IMDB. It's not, you know, the cast is listed. And they have like one or two of the Marines who were in it for, you know, a couple of seconds, uncredited. Yeah. But these two singers who are fairly featured at the opening sequence aren't even listed in the IMDB, which I think is interesting. Okay, another another regular on the show was Missy Vaughn. She was played by uh, Lynn Stewart, was her name, and she's good friends with Terry Bolo. I've got to meet her a few times, and she, I should say, she plays Missy Vaughn, and she comes in wearing this spectacular Christmas dress and this huge hairdo with mistletoe and ornaments and it's all dressed up like a Christmas tree and I mean it's clear that gay people made the show I mean it's so <laughs> over the top it is so over the top and uh, and Lynn said that um, uh, her hair originally was wired for uh, with lights but they saw smoke coming from it so they oh. had to rip the thing <laughs> off of her and it, what, what ends up being in the show is uh, ended up being the one that's not lit up but the show, you know, it, it was quite much like the Pee Wee original uh, Pee Wee Herman show, which was a Groundlings thing, uh, which was, you know, Pee Wee was quite racy at times. Oh, just a shout out, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the original Pee Wee Herman show that's available on, on DVD or probably on Netflix or Amazon. Um, the production designer was uh, Barbara Ling, who was the production designer on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Because oh, wow. that was one of the things that uh, we talked about when I was taking them around. When they said they want to, you know, bring 
Hollywood back to 1969. I said, oh, my God, like the Doors movie. She's like, yeah, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> and then later on, we're talking about Pee Wee, Pee Wee Herman. She goes, oh, yeah, I did that show. And it was just really fun in a nice way. But uh, so Missy Vaughn, um, there's a, there's this there's this, there's a scene that like she she has mistletoe in her hair and she kisses Pee Wee and he says uh, and then you know before you go making out with everyone in the playhouse give me my gift and she gives him the first fruit cake of the show which which right. is a, a running gag and then the floor Flory comes up and says Miss Yvonne stand over me and it's like okay <laughs> here we go there's one of those nods to the old kind of racy Pee Wee Herman show. But, right. uh, and then she runs off saying, there's enough of me for everyone. <laughs> and so, um, so uh, you know, they still touched on the inside jokes. And the fruit free cakes is another joke. Well, I guess we'll hit that a little bit later on in the tour. Or in the tour. So here's where my brain, my brain is. <laughs> on the, um, the, show, on the right? uh, on this podcast, yeah. But uh, so, so, yeah, Lynn Stewart was her name. And she's a nice lady. I've met her a few times, too, at different Groundlings events that Terry has... Uh, brought me to terry bolo not terry the little pterodactyl that's on the show which is i think my favorite character i love terry he's such a little queen um there's conky uh which is uh, like a robot type of character that uh i think is taken straight from max headroom i mean max headroom mm. remember that that car that animated thing the way he yeah. spoke was you know po -po 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 poetry is and how many you know and then conky's yeah, Con Con Conky does that quite a bit on the show, and uh, and he spits out Pee Wee's Christmas list, and and Pee Wee says he wants a yo yo or something. Because you already have a yo yo on your list, and this just brought up an interesting question: If you were an actor in a movie, would you do something that was you thought might be I don't want to say morally, but would you do something that is say well, like for instance, in this in the show, he breaks a mirror. And I would have a real problem with that because I'm quite superstitious. Right. right. And uh, and he he broke a mirror three times to to do this setup for when he's playing with the yo yo and he's supposed to hit the screen. It was a sight guy. Right. He's supposed to hit the camera. And to me, it was like it's like when people do um, shows where they're worshiping Satan. You know, it's like yeah. I always wondered that about people that are, especially if the actor is religious and you're doing something, you're yeah. doing and saying something that was sacrilegious, even though you don't mean it. I always wonder about that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's a good question. You know, the breaking of the mirror thing. It's like I, <laughs> Troy will throw his baseball cap on the bed, and I'm like, no, 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 get it. No, you can't. You can't. <laughs> and um, like if a wait, bird flies that? into a window, forget it. I am I am devastated for wait, your, a year. Wait, what's year, the baseball but... hat on the bed? It's just bad luck. It's really, it's Is like it? shoes on a table, baseball hat on the bed, or any oh. hat on the bed. Uh, if I see a black cat, I will go around the block. I will, I will absolutely, I will not, I, Troy laughs at me, but I will back the car up, you know, I will, I will, yeah, so, um, but hey, I'm really superstitious, so I, I would have a problem with doing something like that. Uh, and I, something else I noticed is that whoever did the sound for this show should have been up for an Emmy if they didn't, because the sound effects are spectacular on this show. You know, every single thing they do, every time he opens up a, 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 you know, a bottle or or something, you know, bounces on the floor or, you know, something's right. moving in the background, every single thing has a sound effect attached to it. It is really, really complicated and good. But right. uh, I was really watching because I watched it like four times the other night because I wanted to hit the regular movie. I watched the commentary track with the actors. I watched yeah. the commentary track with the animators. And then Troy wanted to see it, so we watched it again. But Holy uh, cow. I but I never get tired of it. That's the that's the that's the twisted thing about it. But um not twisted. It just it just shows that it that it that it stands up still. Eighty eight. That's a long time for a show. And it says it was gonna be his first Christmas special, and I forget when, when all that um when that scandal went down where he was caught in the adult movie theater, I don't know what year that was, but maybe that's what stopped the, uh, the Christmas specials from happening. Uh, well, uh, three years later, 91. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not sure why they didn't do it every day. It would have been, well, I don't know. Maybe this one wouldn't have been as, as wonderful if they did it, uh, 
uh, every year after and, this. And, and maybe know. it was so much damn work that they were like, dude, we pulled it off once. <laughs> just uh, like re-air, or just re-air that one. How about instead of yeah. uh, having to do all that work again? Yeah. <laughs> So the um, and, and speaking of the commentary track, actually, it was uh, John Paragon, John B., who was also the co-writer with Paul Rubens uh, and Missy Vaughn, Lynn Stewart. And that has got to be one of the most boring commentary tracks I have ever heard. Paul Rubens is really dull, you know? Pee Wee Herman is out there. Really? But Paul Rubens is like, yeah, oh, this is really good. Oh, yeah. I remember this part. It was really good. Oh my god, I couldn't believe Cher came in. That was really wild. That was yeah. It was like you like thanks honest for the to god. It was like the dullest. I mean, he came up with some good good nuggets, but uh, it was just he. There's no charm to this to this to this uh, track to this commentary track at all. Um, they were fun. They were nice to each other, and it was an interesting nugget or two, as I said. But it was a yawner. I'll tell you. But um, some of the guests, like Little Richard, uh, Little Richard shows up on ice skates in full makeup, full, you know, Little Richard makeup right. with uh, a pillow attached to his butt. And one of the one of the funny because he's on ice and he falls down, he lands on the pillow. That's that's what that's all about. But um, they. I guess during the filming, when he falls down, he asked if um, he asked the staff or the production staff, when I fall down, do you want me to scream like a white woman or a black woman? <laughs> Which uh. is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but he, was, uh, he was an interesting guy. And also, there's a point where Pee Wee Herman, you know, Little Richard's falling down and, and, Pee -wee, and he says to Pee Wee, well, you're so good, you do it. And then Pee Wee comes up and does these amazing ice skating moves. And uh, he's not even credited, but an Olympics... He, a, a, a figure skater came in to do that, and he's oh, not—he's okay. got no credit whatsoever. At the end of it, a special thanks. But his name is Charlie Tickner, and and he's the one that came in. He played Hans, uh, who came in and did this stunt ice skating for Pee Wee Herman. And uh, and anyway, so then Little Richard, uh, you know, that was the big joke. Great gosh almighty! But he was an interesting guy. And uh, and he lived in the Hyatt Regency on Sunset for years, and he would uh, he would um, drive down to Hollywood Boulevard and hand out Bibles. Wait, <laughs> little know? Richard, little Richard lived in the riot lived in the riot Hyatt. Yeah, decades he lived there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is one thing that, I really regret uh, not going up there and saying saying something to him. That would have been wow. cool to meet him. I didn't know he actually lived. I mean, of course that that hotel is legendary, uh, but that's yeah. wild. Resident oh, yeah. of the ho of the riot house. I mean, like you but know, he, Led Zeppelin used to take over entire floors of the hotel. Yeah, but they didn't live yeah. there permanently, so that's wild, huh? Yeah, I, yeah. I would like to know if there was more people that lived in. You know, people lived at the Marmont for years and sure. and uh, and stuff like that. But you, you ask, figure out these hotels. That doesn't seem like some place that uh, that you'd want to take. I know Angeline lives in a hotel like that, a nice hotel, uh, but. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So, uh, but Liberace, I mean, sorry, Liberace, <laughs> Little Richard, <laughs> not that, not that far off. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. And he did do, he had an autobiography out a couple of uh, years before he died. And that thing is really, I mean, he's really honest about stuff. Right. I mean, he's really big into voyeurism and, mm -hmm. and, and sex with men and sex with women. And uh, he was gay. He says, yeah, I was gay before anyone was gay. And then, and then he turned his, you know, his heart over to God and became not gay anymore uh, towards the end. And for some reason, he moved to Tennessee, and uh, and uh, and that's where he lived uh, until he died in Tullahoma, Tennessee, on May 9th of twenty twenty this year of right. uh, of uh, bone cancer. He was eighty seven years old. Wow! They broke the um, mold with him. Uh, you mentioned uh, Paul Rubin's commentary track. Have you ever listened to any of Arnold Schwarzenegger's commentary tracks before? He <laughs> no. Everybody should look this up. I think it was for Total Recall. It's <laughs> it's like what you described basically. He's basically just like narrating what's he what you're seeing on screen. Like, <laughs> and this is when I get into the yeah, car. <laughs> and then and then the character he he uses the rat 
Yeah, they think it's him, but it's not him. It's the rat. And we were like, yeah, I know. We're watching the movie with you. Like, we can see what's happening. Like, why don't you tell us something we don't know? <laughs> yeah, I rarely, it's rarely so will watch a commentary track. It's, it's, you have to love a movie to, yeah. to do that. And there I, are some and really good ones out there. It just depends. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've watched Sunset Boulevard, which is also, you know, not that interesting. It was okay. The, uh, you know, well, Nancy Olsen, I think, is part of it, so she, that, that, was, oh, that was pretty good. The Sgt. Pepper movie, which would get a lot of people asking about us doing a podcast about that, the Sgt. Pepper movie with the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton. Mm-hmm. I love that movie. And there's a, there's a Bee Gees documentary that just came out about a week ago. I was going to ask you about that. And, I heard it's um, great. Well, I haven't seen it, but I, I because I, I was I wrote out a lot of people said oh, it was so good, it was so good, and I wrote well, I hope they gave some love to Sergeant Pepper, and it was like nothing was mentioned at all, and this is like it was pretty a pretty big deal in '78 when that movie came out, and, right? Uh, but universally panned. But when I put something out on Facebook about I hope they gave some love to this movie, every comment is like oh my god, I love that movie, it's one of my favorites, I watch it all the right. time. So uh, so there is some love for that movie. Uh, I watched uh, Serial Mom, uh, that commentary track, uh, mm-hmm. and Kathleen Turner did not get the joke. Yeah, I mean, she was. Uh, there was another one that was like she. They were making jokes, and she was like, I, "That's not funny. I don't get that." And uh, <laughs> so, it, for as good as she was as Serial Mom, I was surprised at how she wasn't. I don't think yeah. she really got it. And. Right. Um, but I'm trying to think of, oh, That Thing You Do. I watched that commentary track, and that was really good. Did you see that thing that they did for COVID? When when COVID first came out, they were the first uh, group of people to do a commentary. Uh, yeah, live. I didn't watch it, no, but I, I, I heard about it, yeah. Yeah, but they couldn't, they didn't have the rights to the movie. So they they were all on YouTube Live, and they go, okay, push play. So you're supposed right. to watch it on your own, and it's like a clever cracks. way to do yeah. it. And, right. uh, but, uh, yeah, but it was, you know, I don't know. I, comment, I have to really love a movie to sit through a commentary track. And uh, yeah. those are probably all of the commentary tracks I've ever watched were the ones I just mentioned. So, um, so yeah, rest in peace, Little Richard. So, Pee Wee Herman. Uh, well, I mean, the other ones are kind of throwaways. Not throwaways, but, you know, there was Whoopi Goldberg who was on, on the phone, on the tele- yeah. video phone. There was Oprah Winfrey, and uh, who was in it literally ten seconds. You know, Pee Wee, let's talk. I can't because I got Whoopi on the phone and hangs up on her. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, Frankie and Annette. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But Pee Wee Herman was a huge fan of the old beach movies from the sixties. You know, Beach Blanket Bingo and yeah, uh, et cetera. And um, and Frankie and Annette starred in a lot of those. And he was actually in Back to the Beach which is a movie they made in the 80s, uh, another beach movie as they were, you know, older. And uh, Pee Wee played, he, he sings Surfing Bird, which is a great song for him to sing. And, uh, but that was, a, that was a, it was a weird movie for them to go back to the beach movies in the 80s with, with uh, you know, in the same locations with Frankie and Annette. It was strange, but Pee Wee was on that because he loved them so much. Otherwise, he wouldn't normally do it. That came out of the commentary track. Uh, they asked him to do it, and he's like, I just want to meet Frankie and Annette. So, okay, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. And then he asked them to be on this show. And he was kind of mean to them, too, on the show. You know, he wouldn't let them go out and play in the snow until they made him, like, 500 Christmas cards handmade. <laughs> um, so, okay, and then there's Grace Jones, who, who came delivered yep. accidentally to the Playhouse by uh, the mail lady who was... Um, Reba, the mail lady, who was that... That person, that woman, Epathica e- e- S. Person, <laughs> I forget her name. I'm terrible at that name because it's one of those weird names that S. Epathica Pearson or uh, Epathica. Uh, you know, what I'm talking about. She was. I um, don't. S. Epatha Merkerson is her name, and uh, and she was. Um, oh my gosh! So she played Reba the Mail Lady. She's won uh, Emmys, Golden Globe, Screen Actors Guild. She was on Law and Order. She was in 395 episodes of Law and Order. Uh, Holy cow. She was in a ton of things. Screen credit: Jacob's Lanterns, Lo- Loose. She's got a habit. Terminator Two, Judgment Day, Navy Seals. She's in a, in a billion different things. But I know her as Reba the Mail Lady, and her name is Essie Patha Merkerson. Which is not an easy name that rolls off the tongue, you know what I'm saying? No, it is not. 
But uh, she accidentally delivers Grace Jones to the Playhouse, who comes out of the box, who was supposed to go to the White House, not the Playhouse, and comes out of the box and... And I, I, there's so many things from this movie that I use all the time. I always just say, you know, back in the box, Grace. I say it all the time. <laughs> it's so stupid. But uh, but then she goes, since I'm already here, how about I sing a song? And she sings Little Drummer Boy. And it's the only time I've ever heard that song that I've liked it because it's my least favorite Christmas song. And she yeah. sings it. And she said Bowie is the one who gave her the uh, the arrangement to sing it. She was on a plane with him and oh, said she was cool. doing the show and so how should I do this and he suggested to do this this way so as I said huh. the only the only time I've ever liked Little Drummer Boys when Grace sang it and it was pretty fun and I got in trouble with Grace Jones we already talked about that one though we did yes what, what episode was um, that that we talked about that Whatever it was the James episode. Bond episode yes the uh, and Cowboy Curtis Lawrence Fishburne who was uh, who was a regular on the series? I don't think he was a, uh, a regular from the Groundlings, but uh, but I did get to meet him. We I think we may have talked about him before, and he was doing a play downtown. He was doing a play downtown, and my friend Steve and I went down there uh, backstage. We didn't go see the play. We we just went backstage uh, <laughs> to the to the stage door for him to come out. And you know, everyone's got these Terminator or not Terminator, a Matrix. Uh, uh, pictures, right. you know, for him to sign. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I pulled out my Pee Wee's Christmas special DVD, which you can't see because huh. of this. And I had him oh, sign. Yeah, I, I showed him this, and his eyes just lit up, and he was like, "That is cool. I really, I love doing that show. I love being part of that show." And mm-hmm. uh, so that was that was a cool thing that that uh, he doesn't <laughs> normally get quizzed about. I think he, but, he was um, happy to sign something that wasn't Morpheus. <laughs> and it was yeah, and he was thrilled to piece. Oh, I got this too. This was um, Pee Wee's Pee Wee autograph. I forget how magical this camera is that it, it, it won't works. show things. Yeah, so if you guys are watching the video zombie. version, Scott's holding up uh, various memorabilia. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Isn't that weird uh, how it shows? It's Pee-wee like, Roman. yeah, I love it. It says "Long Live Jombie." So. Um, <laughs> And um, so, okay, so Cowboy Curtis, Lawrence Fishburne. Okay, so then Joan Rivers, we talked about that. Joan Rivers is literally, and that, okay, so the king of cartoons comes in, and he always says, let's the cartoons begin. And Annette Funicello says, can I do it just this once? He says, of course. So she turns it on. She says, let the cartoons begin. And the Hollywood Squares pops in and is Joan Rivers. So she was actually shooting the Hollywood Squares, which I think was shot on CBS. And they recorded this cameo. And she goes, you know, hi, Annette. Hi, King. Hi, Pee Wee. Merry Christmas. And she has this amazing top on. This is Merry Christmas. But uh-huh. it's funny because when they pull into her and it comes on, she's like in the middle of a question or middle of an answer. So they go, you know, Annette says, let the cartoon begin, and boom, it's Joan Rivers. And she goes, sure, but I wouldn't do it with a bar of soap. <laughs> and that's the way it's done. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> I love that. So so anyway, she does this short ca- uh, cameo. And we know uh, that Joan Rivers died uh, in New York. She was having some uh, throat surgery being done. Yeah. And they, they screwed up her um, her anesthesia and her oxygen intake and she ended up uh, sucks, she stopped breathing and she they tried resuscitating her for about an hour and, and it was unsuccessful and she died of brain damage due to the lack of oxygen in 2014 and her ashes, some of her ashes were scattered in Wyoming but she was also, friends of hers gave her ashes she had some of Vincent Price's ashes and her really? husband Edgar's ashes and all her dog's ashes and uh, yeah, she. In fact, she was doing a show, uh, a um, an appearance on the Howard Stern show, and she knew what a big fan Robin Quivers was of Vincent Price. So she, Robin, she gave Robin some of Vincent Price's ashes, which was kind of huh. interesting. So, Whoa. so Joan Rivers, part of her is scattered in Wyoming. I don't know where the rest of her is, uh, her ashes, but um, they, you know, Melissa certainly knows. But uh, but yeah. Interesting that uh, Joan collected her friend's ashes. There was one guy that gave her... Go ahead. I was going to say, I was a big fan of Joan Rivers. I mean, I, I, I fan of hers. And um, there's a really good documentary on her. I think it's the A Piece of Work documentary. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good. It's really interesting. It uh, shows how she would, you know, how she indexed her jokes, literally on index cards. Uh, really fascinating. And then, um, I for me, Fashion Police was a guilty pleasure on E. 
I I always watch the mm-hmm. Fashion Police ep- episodes after the big award shows. You know, the week uh, the week mm-hmm. after, right? So they would always do it after the Oscars and the uh, Golden Globes and whatever else. That was always like kind of a guilty pleasure for me. So I wish they'd find a way to. You know, they tried to keep it going with uh, Kathy Griffith, uh, Griffin, and uh, uh, and it didn't really work. And I wish they could find a way to make it work again with an, uh, find somebody like her. But I think she's such a one of a kind person. I don't know how you how do you find somebody who's funny and biting like she is, and also knows fashion like she did, because she was a bit of a clothes horse. You know uh, mm-hmm. how the, that uh, I, she just filled a unique. Um, spot that is very hard to replace for a show like that she uh, would now they i mean she it wouldn't survive she would be killed right you know the stuff that she i mean she made jokes about september 11th she made jokes about right. you know diseases and right. aids etc and it was funny and if you don't take yourself too seriously it's yeah. funny stuff lisa lampanelli oh my god you know she'd be <laughs> strung up right now if you if you were to bring out her old comedy routines because yeah. they were you talk about biting and um but nowadays everything has gone so you know everyone's so offend happy they want to be uh, you know annoyed and, and offended by every single thing and yeah. you can't you can't say anything anymore. I mean, somebody said this to me. How can a, uh, I don't know who it was. How can a generation that was brought up on South Park be this sensitive? Way? Yeah. You know? I right. mean, that, yeah. There's a lot of repression, and there's a lot of things that are legit. But there's also sure. it's like really, really. You know, I find I have a problem I find with it really I have a problem hard. when I have a problem when they go back to somebody's tweet from ten years ago that yeah. nobody paid attention to them because they weren't famous yet. And oh, you said mm-hmm. this horrible. But yeah, it was. It was tr- a lot of times, it's especially if it's a comedian, they were just trying to be edgy and boundary pushing to get attention for themselves, basically. And 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 it was edgy then, and now completely unacceptable now because of whatever went and way the winds have you know pushed change since then. But I have yeah. a real problem with retroactively going back and canceling them, somebody for something they did ten, fifteen years ago. I think that's shitty. I think it's a shitty thing to do to somebody. I mean, yeah. I mean, look at. Uh... You know, God, watching the Rat Pack stuff and the way they were with Sammy Davis. I mean, it's like, you know, that's Sammy Davis had to had to endure a lot with those guys, you know. But he did right. it, and nobody's stringing up Sinatra, you know. Um, and I'm not saying he doesn't. It's terrible, you know. And it, right. nowadays, with the culture nowadays, you look at it, you go, "Oh, wow, that was that was tough. That was really right. that was really rough." But it was also the '70s, and if you watch any of those old shows, especially. The Dean Martin roasts when people were right. drinking. Oh, and they just go for it. And it's like, <laughs> damn, you know, I can't believe they <laughs> right. said that. You know? Right. But they're funny. Uh, a lot yeah. of them are just funny, but it's because they're so offensive. And right. um, and that's the point. But now I, it's all about being offended, as you know, and it's just hard because it's really, it's just everything is just exhausting anymore. And it's just no fun. But anyway, enough of that. So, um, so one of their biggest coup on this show was getting Cher, and apparently, that was just a fluke. You know, she responded that she'd do the uh, she'd do the thing. They gave she gave him twenty minutes and or twenty five huh. minutes. She yeah. was in the middle of doing these uh, promotional stuff for her perfume at that time. Okay, so they got her. She came in, did her thing. Twenty five minutes later, she was gone. No makeup. You know, nothing like that. It was just done. And it was right. funny. And she did the magic word, which for you guys, if you don't know, uh, there were, in Pee Wee's Playhouse and in this, there was a magic word. And as soon as you learn out what the magic word is, if anyone accidentally says it, you got to scream. And uh, and Cher's, the magic word for, that Cher got out of Conky, uh, what's the magic word? Out came the, the word year. So uh, every time anyone said Happy New Year, everyone would scream uh-huh. in the Playhouse. And that was... That was the joke. So Cher, and then, and also, you know, it was like this clever stuff. That one of the big characters was Cherry, you know, the, the talking chair. And they go, Cherry, Cher, Cher, Cherry, over there. There's Cherry, there's Cher. And it was, you know, it was really, <laughs> for something they threw together, it's really clever. And uh, the magic screen being, the, you know, Magic Johnson. I mean, it's just, it's just very <laughs> funny. But we touched briefly on uh, the car- the Gingo cartoons and he, his name was William Marshall, and I knew him best because he was in a, a movie uh, called Blackula in the seventies, and another one that's a, a black exploitation film. 
Uh, and another one that is just incredibly unpolitically correct and one of the funniest, one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. It's just a black Dracula. There's a, you know, there's a Blackenstein that was a spoof from it or, a, you know, somebody saw that Blackula was success- successful and they did Blackenstein. And um, so it was, it was a real thing for a while there. But, uh, but Blackula was a great movie and William Marshall played Blackula and he was like a Shakespearean actor. I mean, he was, he had that, ha ha, you know, kind of, uh, of uh, presence to him, and uh, and they got him to do the uh, as as the king of cartoons, and he would always say, "Let the cartoons begin." As I mentioned a little while ago, uh, he let Annette Funicello do it for the Christmas special, but he was once a, a, a protege or an understudy for Boris Karloff, which is fascinating to me. Boris Karloff and William Marshall, or he was he was his understudy. And at the end of his life, William Marshall, he lived on a ranch in Pacoima with his, with his, I think, I don't think they were husband and wife, but they were together for over 40 years and they had four kids. And he died from um, diabetes and Alzheimer's in a long, long-term uh, care facility in North Hollywood. He was 78 years old. And um, it was funny, a couple of years ago in the shop, uh, I had a family come in and... Uh, and they checked him in and they said they were, you know, the name was Marshall. And they said something about, they, you know, a cousin of theirs was in movies. I go, it's not William Marshall, is it? They go, yeah, you know who William Marshall is? I go, yeah, I mean, of course I do. He was Blackula. And, uh, anyway, I go, it was, we got along really well. We talked for a while. I go, do you want his death certificate? And they go, okay. So I went to my computer, done it up, boing. I printed up William Marshall's death certificate, which they'd never seen. So it was kind of, wow. it was, um. So, I don't know. That was one of those weird kind of Hollywood moments. And, of course, Blackula's cousin was in, and that uh, was neat. I love those kind of moments, and I will miss those kind of moments by living in L.A. Um, right. The, those kind of weird things that would never happen anywhere else. Right. But, um, but yeah, so rest in peace, uh, William Marshall. Died June 11th of 2003, and he was cremated, and the locations of his cremains is unknown. Interesting. We talked about uh, William Marshall, and then uh, he took gave the remote to start the cartoon to Annette Funicello, who we talked about a little while ago, How to Stuff a Wild Bikini, Muscle Beach Party, The Monkey's Uncle, which is a, a, wild, a wild movie. But Annette recorded a song called Monkey's Uncle with the Beach Boys. And it's really, it's really <laughs> one of those, it's just a clever 60s dance tune. And she was, um, Annette, you know, in all those movies, the background dancers were, like Tony Basil and Terry Garr. They all show up in all those, you know, Viva Las Vegas. Both Terry Garr and Tony Basil are in the background dancing in Viva Las Vegas. I mean, these are like legendary movies and stock dancers. But uh, like in, in Viva Las Vegas, when Elvis is singing, you know, there's the girl, the little girl, there's the girl with the red dress on. She can do the dog all night long. That girl is Tony Basil. Who remember mm. Mickey? Oh, Mickey, you're so fine. You're so fine. Right. That's her, and she's an epic choreographer uh, for you know decades in movies. She choreographed uh, the dance scene in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and she oh, shows okay. up in all those movies too. <laughs> so, um, but poor Annette had uh, multiple sclerosis, and it's again, it's again one of those things that it's like I don't know. It's just so it's it's especially sad to see somebody who's so vibrant and and just good. Right. And to see, you know, then just that that gradual decline, and uh, and then and then you know she was diagnosed. Then she was in a in a wheelchair, and then she was in one of those wheelchairs. It's like a tray, you know what I mean? That they they just keep to have to move her because of the bed sores and things like that, you know. So she's completely incapacitated, and her house burns down in Encino, you know. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's like this house she's had her whole life or her whole successful life. And right. it burns down. So she ends up going to uh, Bakersfield with her husband, Glenn, who, uh, you know, by all uh, uh, intents and purposes, they were a lovely couple and yeah. adored each other. And um, and the, the, Annette died in, in Bakersfield of a heart attack and pneumonia on April 8th of, 9, of 2013. And I have actually, in my collection of things, I have Annette Funicello's gun permit, which is kind of because <laughs> Annette's the, the Mouseketeer, you know, the... Uh, <laughs> 
and uh, and the you know the beach girl and the jiffy uh, peanut butter uh, you know spokeswoman, and uh, but I have her her gun permit in my uh, museum yeah. that's all stored away right now. But and one a couple of her things too, but uh, and 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 a mailbox. So God bless <laughs> Annette Funicello. <laughs> um, another guest star was Dinah Shore. Now Dinah Shore, mm-hmm. you know, a legendary singer. She was she she did I think the original version of um, Christmas song. Uh, uh, they call it the rape song. Um, uh, Baby, it's cold, cold outside. outside. Uh-huh. Yeah, and she she sang it with uh, originally with um, Buddy Clark. It was, mm. and uh, but she also she had her own. She'd been on television as Dinah Shore in the Dinah Shore Theater and the Dinah Shore Show and just the Dinah Show for like thirty years, and uh, and there was she uh, the Dinah Shore forward hour or something like that she had a song called see the usa in your chevrolet and mm-hmm. uh, that was pretty iconic in the 50s and she was uh brought on as this sort of long joke through the whole show she calls him up and says Pee Wee, i got a little song for you and she starts singing the 12 days of christmas and it goes on and on and on and, and, and it becomes a standing joke too at the end of the show She's on the 500th day. They keep cutting back, you know, uh, to uh, to her singing. Like, they cut away, and then 20 minutes later, they're back to dine, and she's on the 900th day of Christmas, or 500. <laughs> so, but Pee Wee ends up putting a, a little a middle model of himself in front of the camera and then walking away to make it look like... Uh, are you even watching? <laughs> what are you doing over there? <laughs> You're ruining my gag. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking something up. <laughs> By the so, way, what um, shirt, are you, what shirt, shirt are, you, what shirt are uh, you wearing right now? What does your shirt say? Oh, it's it's uh, men without hats. Ah, uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm a huge sorry. fan. I love them without hats. So, um, so Dinah Shore loved the joke. She, you know, she thought it was a hoop, and she uh, and she ended up, you know, having a great time on the show. Now, Dinah Shore herself, uh, she died uh, on February twenty fourth, nineteen ninety four. She was seventy seven years old. Her ashes were actually cut in two, uh, and she's part of her is at Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City. I mean, I'm sorry, Hillside Cemetery in Culver City. Mm-hmm. And the other part is here uh, down the street at Forest Lawn uh, Cathedral City. And, uh, and Dinah Shore, though she wasn't a lesbian, has become an iconic lesbian figure. I was going to bring that it, up, especially because you went yeah, to Palm Springs. She, yeah. And they have the Dinah Shore. They call it the Dinah. And it's a, it's just this weekend, or I don't know if it's a whole week or something like that, where it's just lesbians come from all over the country. Like twenty thousand lesbians can you know, converge on Palm Springs for this uh, celebration. It's like uh, the lesbian pride, uh, right? And um, and uh, and Dinah Shore, for some reason, well, she maybe it was because of the golf thing, you know, Dinah Shore's golf tournament that she started. Yeah. But that's when that's the when they have the Dinah. Yeah, it's, it, the full name, I think it's referred to as the Dinah Shore Weekend, but I guess the Dinah is for short, uh, is what it's called now. Yeah, yeah. It's, probably 90% of the people that show up don't even know who Dinah Shore was, you know what I mean? Right. She's been dead for so long, but <laughs> um, but yeah. So, not, not, and to be confused with, <laughs> not to be confused with Mitchie Shore of the Comedy Store. Right. I, I wonder if uh, Dinah's, uh, what her real name was. It wasn't Mitzi. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what was Dinah Shore's real name? Let's find out. Because uh, look at the shirt, the search that comes in, Dinah Shore lesbians. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> the, when I was doing my research, um, she was born, she was born, oh, this is kind of funny. Uh, her original name was Fanny Rose Shore. Oh, um, we talked about Fanny. <laughs> yes, and Rose, because you ever watched Citizen mm-hmm. Kane, and we mm-hmm. know what Rosebud was supposed to uh-huh. be. That's really funny. So Fanny Rose Shore. Go figure. Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. That's probably why. It was probably because of that uh, you know, that 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 rhyming song that was out. Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. And because mm-hmm. I think that she did do a cooking segment on her show. I don't know if that was the point, but maybe that's why she mm-hmm. chose that. It's interesting. I wonder. Speaking of Mitzi Shore, the other shore, uh, there's a really good um limited doc series on the comedy store that's out right now 
and I don't know oh, if yeah? it's on Netflix or, or Amazon. I think it's on one of the or it's either on one of the streamers or it's on, or it's on, maybe on Showtime. Um, or mm-hmm. one of the cable, one of the cable channels, but it's it's really good. It's really interesting. The whole history of the comedy store, and all the big comics, and they got a lot of great people. You know, the people that are still alive uh, to be in it, and it, it's really it's authentic. It, I thought it was a really good series on the history of that that club, which kind of oh, invented cool. the comedy club as we know it today. You know, the modern version of it. Really. Sure, it yeah. did. Yeah. So many people got their breaks there, and that that was the first. Yeah, it was before the Improv. It was before the Laugh Factory. And did you ever watch uh, so, yeah. I'm Dying Up Here? Interesting. Did you ever watch I'm Dying Up Here, the, the did... scripted series? I'm Dying Up Here. It's a HBO series, I think, or a Showtime series. It was a scripted series. They did two seasons of it a few years ago. It's called I'm Dying Up Here. I think, gosh, I think Jim Carrey may have even been a producer on it. But it was it was loosely based on that. You know, fictional characters mostly. Uh, the comedy drama series um, for Showtime. Uh, premiered in 2017. I thought it was really good. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. executive produced by Jim Carrey. I thought it was great. It only went for two series, but it was still interesting, and it kind of covers a lot of the kind of the same territory that the Comedy Store documentary covers, in my opinion. But um, there's kind of there's a obviously a character based heavily on Mitzi Shore, and the way she ran the club is very similar to how Mitzi did. And yeah, so they, they covered the whole when they when they are, when all the comedians went on strike against her because they weren't getting paid. Uh, it was yeah, and then the whole you know how they all wanted to get on Carson, you know that was your big break, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was really interesting. And one of the guys gets on it. And one of the guys I think was kind of based on um, Freddie Prinze. You know he gets on a, a sitcom and then kind of starts to hate being on the sitcom, and you know he becomes the catchphrase guy. And it, I, I don't know. I thought it was a really interesting series. I was, <laughs> hey, I was Freddie Prinze when he died series. at twenty two. You know, it's just. <laughs> Crazy. It's like you're in a show. I mean, 22 years old is how old he was when he killed himself. I think and it's like, what? Yeah. You haven't. How can you live that down? How can you? Uh, it's not. I, it's mental illness, and and I make. Yeah. I can't. It uh, was. That he judge was mentally him. ill. Just yeah. such a mental mental illness so combined sad. with drugs. With you know, with uh, drug yeah. use. Yeah. He. Uh, yeah. It's crazy what he okay, did. Just, from, how can you I be mean, over it when he was like? He blew up when he was like. He blew up when he was like 19. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and it was over three years later. Yeah. Boy. So I looked it up, and Dinah Shore was on a radio show as her real name, and then she sang the song Dinah, as I was just mentioning, and the disc jockey couldn't remember her name and just called her the Dinah Girl, and that's when she became uh, uh, she became Dinah Shore. So, um, so yeah. And so, so, uh, so yeah, Dinah died. Now, uh, so I started talking about the lesbians, because Katie Lang uh, was, it, she plays, she sings, uh, in in the show, and this is the old Katie Lang. The, the the original Katie Lang, when she started in show business, was doing country music, like bluegrass almost music, huh. and she was being wacky. You know, she wore the weird clothes. Her cowboy boots, her trademark was that she wore cowboy boots that were cut off uh, at the at the ankle, and she would like. She would safety pin little barn animals to her clothes and stuff, and and she she was great. I mean, she had a she has a very distinctive voice, and right. she did probably three or four country records. They were great records. They were mm. my favorites. And then, but she was never accepted because she was a lesbian. Was never accepted by the country music uh, audience. Yeah. And um, and her last album that she did that was country was called Shadowland, and. It's the saddest thing that this wasn't embraced because it was produced by Owen uh, Owen Hart, and Owen Hart produced uh, 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 Patsy Cline and Loretta Lynn mm-hmm. and these legend. And this is old country, you know, that yeah. she's singing these songs and she she kicks these songs asses. And the end yeah. of it, she sings Honky Tonk Angels, and they bring in Loretta Lynn and Kitty Wells and uh, and um, and Brenda Lee. And the four of them sing this song. And it's just like, these are country legends. Here's Katie. And they still wouldn't embrace her. And I think Katie yeah. just went, you know what? Screw you. And she went into, she does her pop music basically for right. lesbians. I mean, that's that's all. I went to see her a couple of years ago. It's yeah. almost all lesbians in the audience, which is fine. I don't care about that. It doesn't matter. She's a great singer. But it just yeah. she just sort of gave up on, on trying to make it as a country singer. And yeah. it's the saddest thing because she's got the talent and she's got the personality. But... Um, she was just never embraced, and and I think they really screwed up because she was she's a great singer. She really yeah. her, her she did um 
crying with Roy Orbison. It's like, oh my God, you can't right. sit through that song and not get choked up. And yeah. um, you know, it's it's just a real shame, a real waste, not a waste, but it's just a, I think a missed opportunity for her uh, to continue doing country music. I thought she was yeah. great, and I guess hers was the um, hers was the longest segment it took to to film uh, for this oh, for the special. They said it took six hours. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> it's just it's just it's just they just it was a fluke. But she sang Jingle Bell Rock. It was it was great. Uh, another quick cameo was well the cowtish who was the the cow who was royalty who uh, and she said everything was moveless and we must get moving <laughs> right. and, um, and um, and they had her introduce her friend Princess Jaja and it was Jaja Kabor and uh, and as another fifteen second cameo you know she comes in it's funny she won't even look at the puppet the cow just just shoves her aside and walks <laughs> in and does you know I love you Pee Wee and and. Uh, and, uh, and and I love you, Princess Jaja. And that was basically a Merry Christmas, and she left. But uh, but yeah, some one of the those... appearances were basically just like hi, <laughs> wave, and then yeah, off. <laughs> yeah. So how's your, so ta- we know how's, your tab, Jaja... how's your tab today? Oh, almost almost empty. You know, you got. Oh. I had to buy more on on on, on eBay. It sucks. <laughs> but it's gone. And, it, you know, what sucks is that it only has a shelf life of like eight months. So once, you know, you, you can stock up, but you got less than a year to drink it. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I'm very precious with my tab. I'm, I, oh. I don't I don't drink all that much. Do you, do you for those of you not following the tab saga, they have discontinued it. So now people are, like Scott, are paying premiums for what's left, the stock that is left out there, and then eventually it will disappear. I believe it was the first diet drink, and uh, and it still has uh, saccharin in it. Hmm. Yep, caffeine, aspartame, yeah, all the good stuff. So, um, <laughs> all the good, all the good chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Shah uh, Jakabor uh, died on December eighteenth, two thousand sixteen. She was ninety nine years old, and. Uh, I went to Zsa Zsa's estate sale. We ended up cleaning up, actually. Uh, got a lot of stuff. And the house was used in uh, Behind the Candelabra, the Liberace movie, which is just like yeah. ticks another box. Right. And um, <laughs> and I bought the, the, the concrete urns. And these things are probably about five feet tall, maybe four feet tall each. These solid concrete urns that were on both sides of uh, her swimming pool that show up mm-hmm. in the movie. So I got those, and those were in the front of the shop for, uh, you know, and, well, as long as we had the museum, and they're yeah. in storage now. And then, uh, what else did I get? Well, Troy bought it. It's funny, he bought this weird tape recorder, and I was looking at it the other day, and he goes, oh, yeah, I got that from the Prince. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, it was at the estate sale. It was like 10 bucks, and the Prince came over. He goes, that's mine. I, it's not Jaja. I know it's mine. I, that was <laughs> mine. It's this weird little, elect, it's this weird little record player. So Troy bought it, and it doesn't work, but it's just an, he likes to collect odd, you know, vintage appliances. Yeah. And then um, I was looking at this uh, shelf. There's a bar, and behind it is a shelf. There's probably five shelves crammed with glassware, you know, just tons of glass stuff. And uh, and I go, how much is that thing in the middle up in the top? The print says, you want that? $300, everything back there is yours. I'm like, Okay. So I, you know, they gave me boxes, and me and the housekeeper are packing. Troy are packing up five these five boxes of glassware from Jaja's house, and all this stuff showed up in behind the candelabra. You know, Whoa. so I'm looking at it, but some of it was like Costco wine glasses and stuff like had the Kirkland <laughs> brand on it. So <laughs> right. you know, but still, I mean, they came out of Jaja's house and they showed. I, I even had my little um, my little Jaja. I brought them to show you know, little uh, cocktail weenie sticks. I oh, have those a are bunch cool. of these. Yeah, so these are from Jaja's What are Jaja's they? Like, what's house. on them? There's little what forks. Yeah, but they're... What, and is no, they're, just... they're like stones. They're, oh, uh, interesting. They're different um, sort of... Here's a yellow one that'll show up a little bit better. But they, yeah. they're little rocks and little polished stones. So, um, oh, those are cool. So I got... Yeah, they are cool. They're, so I've got a ton of stuff at Jaja's. I wanted her glasses... Because uh, there's a pair of prescription glasses, and the housekeeper told me that Jaja would do her pro- crossword puzzles with these. I think I like stuff like that, you know. Yeah. So, um, but it ended up being um, oh, some designer I don't know who who it was, and uh, they were like twenty bucks. I go, okay, I'll buy those. They go, no, 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 that's that's Mark, whatever his name was, this designer. I go, yes, yeah, so, 
And he goes, yeah, yeah, but those are expensive frames. I said, yeah, but they're prescription. What are you going to do with them? And he's right. like, I can get new new lenses made. I'm like, whatever, man. He goes, I'll give it to you for a hundred. It's like, you know, forget no. it. Just forget it. Right. So you know, I, estate sale people are dicks. You know, when they're like that, I hate when they're like, oh, that. Oh, that's going to cost you. <laughs> so anyway, poor Zsa Zsa. So so Zsa Zsa's funeral was at uh, Good Shepherd Catholic Church on Sunset and uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard. Is it Sunset? No, Santa Monica Boulevard in Beverly Hills. And it's where Ava Gabor's funeral was, too. I went to her funeral back in 95, I think it was. But the prince brought Zsa Zsa's cremains in a Gucci dog carrier to, to the <laughs> funeral. So Zsa, Zsa was taken to her own funeral in a dog carrier by her husband, <laughs> which was actually on, on sale in the estate sale. And I really wanted that, but they wouldn't break up the, uh, it was Louis Vuitton. They wouldn't break up the set, but I really wanted the dog uh, carrier. So I found a picture of me holding the, 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 uh, the yeah. dog carrier. Uh, but yeah, and then Zsa, Zsa is buried uh, underneath Ava, Ava's tombstone at Westwood Cemetery. The prince went there, they lifted up the tombstone, they, I guess they pour Zsa, Zsa there or buried her there. And covered her back up so she doesn't even have a tombstone. But I was there the day of the funeral, and I could tell it was mm. done. And there's a picture of uh, the prince and uh, at the tomb that day. So, so yeah. So poor, poor Zsa Zsa. But she was a trip. She was a trip. And uh, oh, and also the other thing I got there was this really weird photo album. And in it were personal photos. Like the prince was literally tearing Zsa Zsa's albums in half and selling them. Uh, you know, and Elisa Jordan, actually from LA Woman Tour, she bought one of the one of the halves and gave it to me. And I'm going through these pictures, and I'm like, there's these tons of pictures of Zsa Zsa and all these other people and this guy, and it's in like some New York apartment. And I'm looking, I'm looking, it's like yeah, there's a cake there. I wonder if it's one of her husbands. So I looked it up, and I looked up, and it was one of her husbands. It was her wedding with the husband. So I'm looking at the other people, and there's this girl there with this like bouffant hairdo. And she's younger. So I'm like, I wonder if that's the kid of the husband. So I cont- I looked up on Facebook and I found out we have one mutual friend. So I said to my friend, why don't you reach out to this woman and say, is this the one whose father was married to Zsa Zsa? So she reaches out to me and says, yeah, that was me. I said, I have your, your father and, and Zsa Zsa's wedding pictures and you're all over oh. those pictures. And she's like, oh, that's the weirdest thing. She goes, I'm going to be in L.A. next week. Do you want to huh. get together? So she came to the shop and I showed her all these pictures and she was telling me who they were in the pictures and, and talk. Yeah, it was just a, a weird Facebook, Internet, oh, my God thing. And that's all down awesome. to the prince, prince selling, selling Zsa Zsa's personal photographs, which I find really offensive actually i mean i'm glad i have them but right. i like i troy loves going through people's pictures in estate sales and I, I find it like so gross because it's like you know i would die if like my parents pictures ended up in some estate sale and people were like yeah. flipping through them and go oh for for a dollar you can have three of them so i have all my personal photographs have been scanned in and every physical photograph is in a box that's sealed up and there's instructions to burn it when i die because i don't want a single one of these photos ending up in somebody pawing through it in some estate sale i find that so gross i always i just think it's weird that like the, the, that there is no family that wants the personal stuff like that like the personal photo albums yes. those are like the greatest heirlooms in my opinion are the old photo albums of the families you know most yeah. of the people are gone now you know and that's why i saw um I really wanted to do – I tried to do this online auction a few years ago they did that was of um, uh, Irving Thalberg and Norma Shearer's estate. And, uh, and like, they had, they had, like, a wedding – their wedding photo in a frame that was the actual one that hung in their home, you know, in Santa Monica that they had on the beach there. And I remember thinking, like, aren't, yeah. aren't any of his relatives still alive that would still want that? Like, it's always so strange to me. And I also follow a lot of World War II memorabilia stuff. And I, I'll see stuff like that come up. You know, some airman's personal effects in his bomber jacket and, you know, his flight records and stuff. And I'm like, what? His kids don't want that? Like, it's really strange to me when yeah. I see stuff like that get put on for sale. But sometimes people don't have heirs or they aren't close to them or whatever. So it's better than throwing them away, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I guess it, in a situation like that where you're talking about literal history, 
Um, you know, maybe there is an appreciation for that with somebody else who might, yeah. you know, I mean, it's like that, you know, Troy and I don't have any kids. We don't want to have kids, but we got a lot of stuff. We're really sentimental yeah. people. And now that we're moving, I can see all the crap I have that my grandparents <laughs> made or my dad made. And yeah. we're here. And once we die, it's like that's going to end up in some estate sale. It's a uh, it's a real shame. I mean, I have a niece and a couple of nephews, but I don't think they have a. You know, not a not as sentimental as we are, and, right. and at the end of the day, they're just kind of you know stings. But uh, right. but yeah, sentimentally, it was important to us to save them. But what you know, what do you do with them then when you, when you die? Which is why which is why the estate sales and the thrift stores are so huge here. Right. You know, yep. Like, exactly. But personal photographs, I find that so gross. I just gotta no, they gotta be burned, burned. I don't. <laughs> I do not want people pawing through them. <laughs> There's an element that you know when you're famous, when you or if you if you pursue fame, that's that's fair game in a way, but it's still really really personal. It's like ah, I don't know. Anyway, so uh, so so okay, Mrs. Renee, who was on the show, Suzanne Kent, she brought the Jewish thing, and I never knew the dreidel song, which I thought was interesting. Uh, you know, to learn about Hanukkah and the seven, you know, the eight nights of Hanukkah. You know, as a person who was never brought up around Jewish people, it was interesting to see that, and interesting to find out that the, the dinosaur family who lived behind the walls were actually Jews, which I love, and they had a little menorah and stuff it's, like that. It's funny you hadn't heard that song, because it, this around the time that this happened, I was in elementary school when this came out. I was the perfect age to be a Peter Herman fan, but I wasn't. Uh, I, I never really watched his show, but um, I had friends that were into him. But we always did, you know, the Christmas concert every year, right, for elementary school, and there was all we always sang the dreidel song. It was like the one little hat tip that they, they always yeah. that the program did to the, any of the Jewish kids that were in school. Uh, of course, it was the rest of it was all songs about Santa Claus. Um, but then we always did the dreidel, 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 you know, made of clay song. Um, so that's interesting. You you didn't you weren't as familiar with that one. No, no, but it's funny you bring that up too, because I was when I was in in elementary school, our music teacher really, you know, he taught us Hava Nagila, and I none hmm. of us knew what it was. I've been to Jewish right. weddings now, and they where they sing Hava Nagila, and I know the words to it, which is weird. But I didn't know what it was. We didn't know. We weren't told what it was. We were just singing right. this this song in this different language, and I remember we sang Spanish Eyes, you know, blue Spanish eyes. And then uh, I remember, because, you know, this little kid, these kids in Detroit are singing, it was uh, C, say, 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 it's C, say, C, C, you know, as in yes, yes, say, C, C. And we, we sang it, say, 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 because we didn't know <laughs> how to, say, know how to, to speak in C. Spanish. <laughs> C, say, say, say. <laughs> You saw the S I and thought but, it was pronounced Sai. That's really funny. It's Sai Sai. We were taught that by the music teacher, <laughs> but at least, but we were well rounded in that regard. You know, we we were learned we learned how to sing uh, uh, w- different songs that weren't just you know little American songs. That that was yeah. I forgot about that until just now. It's interesting. God, that was fun. Anyway, Detroit Public Schools shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. We've got uh, we've got Ricardo, who was the resident hunk. Pee Wee always had a resident hunk in you know a sports guy in a soccer costume. There was always one in all the shows, and Ricardo was the one in this one, played by an actor named Vic Trevino, and he he showed Pee Wee how to do the pinata, which he would never heard about before, and he's teaching him how to do this on the show, and uh, and then they bring in Charo. And Charo, who is the, you know, Spanish, American, well, she's Spanish, born in Spain, singer, who uh, is top 10 classical guitarists in the world, sings yeah. Feliz Navidad, and uh, and also holds the record for Love Boat appearances, Charo does. Oh, and, interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so she sings Feliz Navidad. Ricardo, the hunk, is the one who taught, taught Pee Wee how to do it. And, um, and uh, just as a side note... Uh, Charo lives on the corner. This is dark. Charo lives in the Charo lives in the corner of Benedict Canyon, and um, I forget what the name of the Lomit not Lomitas, but there's that side street because technically she lived like a door down from Lucy, and um, but Charo, um, her husband, just to go back to the curse of Benedict Canyon, uh, yeah. last year committed suicide in the alley behind the house with a gun. Uh, so there's there was another sort of check mark to the curse of benedict canyon i think wow but he'd been ill for a long time and uh 
and it just uh, I don't think anyone was prepared for that but it, it you know it is what happened and Charo Charo is such a sweet lady she's like the Spanish Dolly Parton you know mm-hmm. and and just a kind lady and she she became a big uh, 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 I don't want to say I don't know if it's TikTok or what Instagram when the COVID first started kicking in uh, she had a video that went viral that was uh, her, washing your hands. And she's mm. famous for being beautiful, having a large chest and making jokes and being the, you know, the butt of jokes or whatever. And she would say things and mispronounce them. And it was funny. And, and so she was saying, you're supposed to count to 20. So uh, when you're washing your hands. Right. So you in America would say you would count to Mississippi, but she couldn't say Mississippi. So she she say Michi Pee Pee. She's saying one <laughs> Michi Pee Pee, two Michi Pee Pee. <laughs> oh, God bless Charo. <laughs> She is a national treasure, and uh, and she still looks amazing. She looks fantastic, and uh, she doesn't look like she's d- aged a day since this show was made. So, uh, which brings us after that to uh, the Del Rubio triplets. Yes, three gals, three guitars, one birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and who were they for people who don't know? Oh, well, they were uh, they were they were identical triplets, Edie, Millie, and Elena, and uh, and she they sing uh, and play guitar, and they were not particularly good at singing, <laughs> right? But they were again three of the most charming people, uh, identical tw- identical triplets, which alone is like my eyes pop out of my head because I think it's <laughs> fantastic because it's an unusual people thing, and I love unusual right. people. And they dressed alike. They always stood in the same order, the order that they were born. They would always be, uh, I had to write it down, Edie on the left, Millie in the middle, and Elena on the right. Anytime they entered a room or left a room, <laughs> or the, whenever they signed autographs, whenever they, you know, it was always in that order, the, in the well, order that they were born. And they became sort of cult uh, TV. I think Pee Wee's the one who brought it to my attention. They were around mm-hmm. L.A. and they would play cabaret stuff. They would sing like Whip It, and they'd sing... Uh, uh, um, light my fire on the mm-hmm. guitar, and they sang in the show in the Winter Wonderland. They sang Winter Wonderland in Pee Wee's Christmas special, but they were just bizarre. Big blonde hair, you know. They were clearly, you know, in their seventies when they were doing this, right. wearing mini skirts and go-go boots, and singing <laughs> Winter Wonderland. And it was a sight to be to be held. They ended up on Letterman. They ended up on Married with Children. They ended up on Night Court. They were, I think, they may have been on the Golden Girls. I mean, they became real celebrities in their own. And right. they, there was a show. I just found this the other day. There was a show in the eighties called The New Monkeys, and it really? was they were they were fabricating this new group of monkeys. The Del Rubio triplets were on an episode. And they sing this song, and it's like right psychedelic stuff. I mean, the, the Del Rubios don't sing at all in this. That they're they, but they made them look so cool and so hip. The Del Rubios were kind of silly. They were kitschy. They were campy. They weren't terrifically good. But back when they were first discovered, they used to travel around in a station wagon to nursing homes and sing for for nothing. They just wanted gas money. There was there were three of the nicest ladies. And uh, and then, you know, so they started finding this cult following. And then Pee Wee put them on this, and that's what brought it to my attention. But then they were doing the bars. They did a, they did a bar tour uh, in Chicago that I saw them do uh, a show at, a, at a, a bar called Berlin. I just could not be nicer and sweet, uh, sweet ladies. And, uh, and uh, here's my autograph, Del Rubio triplets. To Scott from them. They're, oh, look, I, I, I don't know if I put this in there, but I'll put this on for a second. There's my picture with the Del Rubios. <laughs> I love them. But yeah, they, they were just, uh, just the nicest, nicest people. And, uh, and uh, God bless them. So let me go back to my regular office. Okay. So Edie, uh, Millie, Elena, they were born August 23rd, 1921 in the Panama Canal Zone. And uh, and uh, their actual birth name was Boyd, but they chose they chose the name Del Rubio because Rubio means blonde in Spanish. And um, Edie died of cancer in 1996. Elena in 2001 of cancer, and Millie died of pneumonia in 2011. And they're buried all at Holy Cross Cemetery. They're very, um, very. Um, 
they took their religion, their Catholicism, very seriously. I, I think they were virgins, too. Uh, I, I do believe that they probably, because they, they did everything together, you know, when they're going to have a church. They lived in a, in a mobile home in, in, uh, in uh, Palos Verdes, uh, in a mobile home park on the ocean. And they'd always drive in the same car. Was, they were something, and they lived it. They really, really lived it. So, um, so God bless them. So uh, the Del Rubio triplets are all dead. God, Millie was the last one. And I was at a party. And I spoke to Millie a couple times. I had her phone number. Oh, this, let's just skip this. It doesn't matter. No, it's, no, it's going to make hear this it. look like a dick. No, it's, I, it's just sort of, I, I knew that Millie was long-winded. And I always thought, well, why don't you get back together again? Just do, do yourself, you know? And I didn't realize that this, in retrospect, I realized how, callous that was you know because they were a trio and she would never dream of going out on her own and uh, so i said well you know why don't you do appearances as as yourself and and you know it just it was not nice and i wish i had more more tact than that back then uh it's sad but there as you could tell she was defeated after uh, her sisters went so it's really sad and uh, that she lived for as long as they as she did after the other two were gone. That had to have been really difficult for her. So, um, so yeah. One of the things, okay, so through this whole movie, the whole, one of the big gags throughout the movie is the fruitcakes. Everyone gives him a fruitcake, and he's like, everyone right. supposedly hates fruitcake. And, you know, so there is sometimes, there is a, uh, I want to say, this, this movie would appeal to gay people for a lot of different reasons. And <laughs> something that, is funny is that the, Pee-wee gets so many fruit cakes that he decides that he's going to be he's going to make a fruit crate a room out of fruit cakes, and right. <laughs> I'm building a new wing to the playhouse made entirely out of fruit cakes. And, right. Um, and they open up the doors, and there's these two shirtless guys dressed like construction workers, you know, putting <laughs> fruit cakes together, uh, making walls out of these things. It's like, or you know, and then the commentary track, they even, you know, they were kind of laughing to each other without saying it because they didn't want to spell it out, but right. it was clearly right. a nod to, you know, to something. It's just quite quite funny to have fruit cakes and have like the village yeah. people there. So <laughs> those it was kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the last thing it was Aaron Fletcher is uh, who in all the commentary tracks agreed that he was Santa. I mean, he was Santa on the show, but he was like the most legitimate Santa ever. You know, he looked it, right. he, he lived it, he sounded it. And not like the other. Remember, uh, I think we talked about Leroy Shells before. He was the guy that changed his name to Santa and lived in the North Cold Pole in New York. And right. Ended Our up first dying show ever, like, I think we talked about. Yeah, that. Yeah. He died like the day before Christmas. It was so sad in a hotel room in <sighs> Chicago. Right. But uh, of a heart yeah. attack. I mean, there was nothing wrong with him. But uh, but anyway, this guy, Aaron Fletcher, played. he was on St. Elsewhere. He was on a sitcom starring um, uh, Sally Struthers. And uh, and he played Santa and this show in 1988, in March of 1990, he passed away. I couldn't find a cause of death, but he was only 63 years old. He died in Los Angeles in 1990. So uh, God bless you, Santa. And um, and the only the, the other thing I was going to talk about uh, was um, what well, you wanted to talk about, uh, uh, somebody that was involved with the movie. In what way? Yeah, so uh, Wayne White is an artist who uh, was involved with the whole Pee Wee Herman series. Uh, and he, um, I think he did some animation work for them for the show, and he did set design and just wherever they needed, right? And he, he got, he kind of got his own prominence as a visual artist years later. He started doing these paintings um, where he would basically, you, you take a painting that you find at like a thrift store, or like a flea market, right? One of these like cheapo uh, landscape paintings, like something you'd see in like a doctor's office, right? Something really kind of drab and boring, like a, a mountain meadow or a seascape. And he started painting onto them. So he would paint like uh, his big thing was he would paint words into the picture and he would do them in 3D kind of in the scene. So it looked like there were giant letters, you know, hanging, hovering over the lake. Right. And they would say weird shit like probably the one that's most famous uh, is just like a, a, tr a, a forest scene. And he put the words uh, fan fucking tastic <laughs> in letters across it. You know, so there's like a lot of humor uh, in them. Uh, in these paintings, and they got big. And what's wild is that uh, I uh, 
when I was early years in LA, probably about 15, 16, 17 years ago, uh, there was a diner on Vermont street there in kind of Hollywood, Los Feliz area, um, that had his paintings for sale on the walls. And I remember oh, seeing that these had and to being have been, struck uh, by how Fred sixty two or something. That right? was it. It was Fred sixty two. Yeah. I'm almost positive they had some of his paintings. Yeah. And I came, man, I came really close to buying one, and they they were maybe thousand, twelve hundred bucks, and it was just a little too much for me at that, especially at that time, for me to be able to do. Yeah. Um, and it's a bummer because now they go for like ten to twenty grand. Like they're sought after, pretty sought after paintings. Oh right, uh, I just and, I just found the the uh, the fan fucking tastic one. That is really cool. It's so cool, right? So they did a, a documentary on him a few years ago called Beauty is Embarrassing, the Wayne White story that is really interesting. And there's a bunch of stuff in it about uh, the PB, his work on P.B. Herman as well. So P.B. Herman fans, definitely check the documentary out. And it's just really interesting just to see this, uh, the creative outpouring from this one person, you know, how, how would the, how, what the kind of creativity that was behind, you know, that show, the creative minds that, that were behind it is really fascinating. So I'm yeah. always, I mean, I'm a creative, I'm a creative person, but I almost, I'm always in awe of people that are like, super creative you know like you know um uh, uh just how you only see one percent of their ideas that they have you know they're just bursting mm-hmm. with ideas so yeah he's, mm-hmm. it's interesting mm-hmm. so beauty is embarrassing the wayne white story uh yeah it's a really good doc another woman that worked on the show was uh, her, uh the makeup person v neal who uh who did zombies makeup the the genie whose head is in the is in the box but she uh she won an emmy for the Wee herman show uh, for the, her makeup, she did the makeup for Mrs. Doubtfire. She did the makeup for uh, for Beetlejuice, and she also did. Uh, there was a show that was really big. Uh, I don't know if they still make it called Face Off. It's all about. It's one of those competition shows where people were doing like horror yeah. and science fiction makeup, and she was a regular on that. But she she won an, an Emmy for the Pee Wee Show, which is which is pretty wow. cool. And uh, and lastly, I guess the only other thing that I found of, of relevance, I mean, uh, to me, there's a lot of stuff that we didn't even talk about, but 48 minutes sure. of TV, and here we are, t- spending hours on it. But um, <laughs> one of the puppeteers was Van Snowden, and Van Snowden was uh, most famous for being on, where is my picture? On uh, He was the puppet for H.R. Puffin stuff. Oh, and right on, hold it up a little higher. My, yeah, I got to uh, I got to meet him and I talked That's to him cool. about the production of the show, which was pretty neat because I wanted to know more about Jack Wilde, who was the star of HR Puff mm-hmm. and stuff, and uh, and he was a really really nice guy who's dead now. Actually, I didn't I didn't get the details of his death, but uh, but Van Snowden, rest in peace. He did some amazing puppeting, and that's what I have on Pee Wee's uh, Pee Wee's Christmas special. I think we did it. And again, you can watch it, I believe, on Netflix now, uh, so you can see what it is we're talking about. It is a wild and kooky special. Uh, Yeah. Like 48 minutes or whatever it is long. (laughs) Uh, um, All right. Well, thank thank you to everybody. Uh, Thank you again to our Patreon supporters. Uh, It's patreon.com slash dearly departed pod if you want to become a supporter, if you aren't one already. Um, You can join for as little as two bucks a month. And ha- everyone have a, a very happy Hanukkah. Well, I think Hanukkah's over with now. Uh, and I have a very Christmas and happy new year. Ah! Goodbye, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what, though? Doing this show made 2020 a little more tolerable, I think. And I think it did for people that <laughs> listen as well. So it, it did for us as well. I hope so. Having something to focus on. <laughs> uh, it did for me anyways. I, I uh, It's something fun to distract i guess yeah yeah i hope so i hope it makes it gives, gives a couple of people a laugh so here's hoping that 2021 brings back some sense of normalcy to the world whatever that even means anymore but uh hopefully things t- look up in the new year mm-hmm. so agree all right guys we will see you uh, and we will see you in in the new year take care uh, we'll thanks again January. Now I'm going to go make a cocktail with Jaja's weenie fork. <laughs> As you do. <laughs>